All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started. So again, uh, welcome everyone. I'm Aaron Van Alstafjord. I'm the global head of the KCS Academy. I'm joined by Kelly Murray, our chief engagement officer, Jennifer Mortcat, our community success manager, and uh, Matt Seaman, who is our executive director. And pleased to introduce Monique Kadena, Amit Singh, and KK Rao from Akamai. And Monique leads the KCS program at Akamai and is a KCS innovator. And Amit is the Director of Strategy and Operations and the KCS Sponsor. And KK is the K KCS Trainer and Lead Coach. And the ACMI team will offer guiding principles for a successful KCS adoption. And is gonna offer perspectives from three angles, the sponsor, uh, the practitioner, and the knowledge worker. So that should be very interesting, those three perspectives. Um, but some housekeeping before we begin. The session is being recorded and will be posted on the consortium site for members, as well as sent out to all who have registered. And please post your questions in chat. And the ACMI team, and they have a number of additional people from the ACMI team, will be monitoring the chat and will answer them in the chat or save them for the Q&A session at the end. And there'll be ample time for Q&A at the end. And while you're not speaking, please put yourself on mute. And it's always great to hear about the digital transformations happening in the broader community, whether it be the successes, uh, strategies and tips, as well as ditches people encountered and how to avoid them. So if you'd like to present at a future cases in action, please reach out to me and we'll get you on the calendar. And I'll post my contact information in chat shortly. But I'm very excited about uh, today's event and pleased to pass it over to my team. Thanks, Arnfin. Um, as Arnfin said, we're really offering this guidance from three perspectives, and that's sponsor, practitioner, and uh, originally we're thinking knowledge worker, but we found that there was more valuable content to also look at this from the lens of a trainer and lead coach. So we have a bit of everything kind of combined in here. And before each of our sections, we'll uh, go through full introductions, uh, but first a little bit about who we work for. So Akamai Technologies is a global content delivery network, cybersecurity and cloud service company, providing web and internet security services. And Akamai is the world's largest, most advanced distributed edge platform. And Akatech is the name of our technical support organization. Now a little bit about me. So I've worked in this field for over 20 years. And in 2016, I was recognized by the Consortium for Service Innovation as an innovator for my experiments and work that contributed to the development of KCS version six. And over the years, my work has included the evolution of coaching and KDE programs, the 90-0 publication goal for self-service, but most importantly, the why. In the practices guide and case studies that I've been part of, you'll see that we reference the why a lot. And that why is part of something bigger and that's organizational change management or OCM. Those techniques and practices are critical for a successful program so in our pre presentation today, we'll incorporate a lot of our OCM tips. So going into Akamai's KCS program, uh, the summer of 2017 is when we officially kicked off. And people always ask about our timeline. So we put this slide together, but please know that it's not going to be the same for everyone. It really depends on the size of your organization, the number of training waves, trainers, geos, and so forth. Um, by the end of January 2018, we had rolled out training to everyone in support. And then we spent the rest of the year focusing on adoption. And by 2019, we were ready to start planning our KDE program, which is still evolving today, especially in the area of problem management. So that initial rollout was very exciting. Um, I have to say for me, having done this many, many times before, um, it was my favorite and by far the best experience because everyone was invested and it really paid off. And these are the outcomes we saw in just the first six months. And every year we continue to see them sustained or improved, which means we have a hugely successful KCS program here at Akamai. 
but on this webinar, we're not going to spend a lot of time telling you about our journey and the outcomes. You're here because you know KCS produces results. So here's our one slide showing our initial results. But we think it's more valuable to share with you how we did it. So the format we came up with is a collection of frequently asked questions that we get from other organizations, uh, consortium members, and people that often reach out to us via LinkedIn and other channels. We took those FAQs and we converted them to topics that we'll cover today. And they include our approach and what we found to be successful based on our experience. And to start with, one of the top things people always wanna know about is executive buy-in. So I'm gonna hand it off to Amit and he'll get us started. Awesome, thank you, thank you, Monique. All right, very quickly about myself. Um, I've been in the Boston area for the last uh, 20, 20 or so years. I have always been in enterprise software in support and services. Um, and during that time, I've spent um, at least four cycles going through uh, a knowledge-centered uh, services model being rolled out. And I've consumed it in different um, uh, capacities as well. The first time I saw it was as an engineer and then uh, the, the remainder of the three times was, was either rolling it out or as a sponsor, as, as, uh, as was the case in Akamai. Um, and the, the Akamai uh, architect leadership team is the one that you can see on the bottom right over here, by the way. Uh, that was uh, pre-COVID. Um, we went into an escape room in Boston. We could not escape, uh, but I did safely establish that I liked pie that evening. Uh, but since that has nothing to do with uh, uh, knowledge management, let's move right along uh, to the next slide. All right. So as Monique mentioned, um, organizational change management is sort of key to, um, to how you roll out and how you sustain a knowledge management practice. And uh, at a very high level, these are sort of the four uh, phases that we'll kind of talk through, but we won't get into all the details. We'll try to tease out the things that we feel are key takeaways uh, when it comes to uh, these sections. So um, I'll get into the approval piece uh, for us first. Next slide. All right, cool. So uh, this was 2016. Uh, I had uh, just become a part of the Akamai um, leadership team. And I was trying to figure out how might I start this program. The background was uh, they had already uh, tried a couple of times and had um, little success with uh, rolling out uh, KCS to the organization. And there was a lot of intrepidation uh, within the leadership team itself on whether we should even try doing this again. Uh, but me looking at things from a strategy perspective, I knew that if we didn't have a strong knowledge management program as a foundation for the organization, anything else that we wanted to do on top of it, which was, you know, whether you wanted to introduce new channels of support, you wanted to deliver more self-service, more internal uh, uh, quality standardization, more um, uh, uh, just more quality and consistency and standardization. You just couldn't do those things without a robust knowledge management system in place. So, I mean, I understood this, but I knew that the leadership team that was there had varying levels of understanding here. So I remember the first thing I did was I actually got an industry expert who had actually practiced knowledge management many times, um, 10, 12 years of experience uh, helping various customers as a consultant. I brought that person online for a four hour session. The first one and a half hours um, was just educating the leadership team on what KCS is, what its benefits are, giving them just enough of an understanding of the, of the framework. And then the following uh, two and a half hours or so, was solely dedicated to answering questions. Um, and I had a lot of support from uh, you know, the, the, the leader of that organization where he sort of set the stage that, you know, this is your chance to ask all your questions, get everything out there. And let's see if at the end of it, we can come together as a leadership team to say, 
whether we can get behind this or not. And you know, uh, quite a wonderful thing happened. We educated the leadership team. They understood, even if even if they didn't um, believe in the whole program or couldn't get completely behind it, they understood why it was um, the right thing to do, how it tied to their business goals and their business challenges that they were seeing. And coming out of it, I can safely say that they were supportive uh, and some of them are probably cautiously supportive of it, but they were supportive. And that support at the leadership level was key to get because we knew we had a lot more work to do, a lot more change to bring through the organization. And if this team wasn't on board, then there was gonna be you know, a much more uphill task for us. So educate your leadership team is, is really the takeaway there. Um, then we did a lot of work on you know, understanding uh, what our why was. Uh, what our problem statements were, what the benefits were, and really tying it back down to uh, the strategic framework. And we have an example of that we'll share, to you, we'll share with you as well. And we actually spent a lot of time just creating a charter that talked about um, uh, you know, why we should do this, how would we approach it, uh, why will we succeed this time, and so on and so forth. So a lot of work was done in the charter. And, and I'll tell you what, uh, even as late as, as earlier this year, we went back to, to the charter a couple of times and said, what had we said about how we were gonna do this you know, long-term and actually found a lot of value there. So, and that also gave the executive team a lot of confidence that the whole program had been thought through very methodically upfront, um, which was confidence inspiring for them. Uh, next slide. All right, so uh, we know that uh, often, Many people kind of struggle to tie uh, you know, benefits to the organizational goals. So what we did was we included our strategic framework that we used uh, back in 2017, actually. And um, uh, what we did over here, along with the problem statement and the objectives was, was create these, um, uh, these uh, 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 the, the framework itself. Now, keep in mind the framework often uh, from a, um, uh, from a consortium perspective, has three primary stakeholders, the requesters, the knowledge workers, and the organization. We actually combined it for sake of simplicity into one. And this is what we used um, as the framework. And you'll be able to see this um, in the recordings and such. So I won't go through all the details, but uh, it's a good, um, uh, good overview uh, that you have here. If you go to the next slide, and this is really the, uh, sort of the, the meat of it, right? So now we had, again, like I said, we tried KCS a couple of times um, and we knew that we had to hit headlong, why would we succeed this time? And we took the common framework of people process technology to kind of explain why we would uh, and what we would do differently in each one of these areas. So um, the first thing was we, we knew that we had to focus on the right behaviors as opposed to the metrics. I think um, all of you who have, who have tried uh, or, or pulled out, um, pushed out these programs, if you over metricize this, all the wrong, wrong type of things happen. And the challenge really is you have hundreds of people who you have to uh, uh, encourage them to behave differently every day when they're interacting with cases and, and creating knowledge. And that's not an easy task to do. It cannot be accomplished with a, an hour long KCS uh, training session, for example. It can only be addressed through coaching and periodic frequent coaching. So we actually spend a lot of time on coaching itself and KK will get into some of that. Um, and we had uh, initially, especially we had weekly coaching sessions uh, for, all, for all our engineers uh, so that they could they could be given very clear uh, guidance on what they were doing, how they were working, how exactly uh, could they improve, and that is what helped us sustain the change uh, in behaviors. Um, last but not the least, from a from a people perspective, we were very lucky to bring uh, Monique on board uh, during the initial phases of the rollout of this program. And having one person who A, was very knowledgeable about the program, about the methodology, and then 
it was her day job to help keep the program up and running and sustain it. That made, made all the difference, right? Even today, um, we are essentially a center of excellence within the company even uh, when it comes to knowledge management uh, because of Monique's uh, involvement here. Uh, next is process. So, you know, I often tell people that if you're rolling out uh, knowledge management, think of it as 70% organizational change management and maybe 20% technology and so on and so forth. Um, it is a lot about OCM. So um, that's, that's, and there's so much in OCM itself, we, we, we don't have to unpack that here, but just keep that in mind. It's all about OCM. Uh, the next piece is, you know, you got to make sure for a, for a knowledge management system to function, your underlying case management system has to be uh, optimal for knowledge management. So I remember uh, before we rolled out knowledge management back in 2017, we had to quickly go back and actually make some tweaks and provide some best practices and guidance to the whole organization on where we expected certain pieces of information in, in the structure of a case so that it flowed well into uh, the knowledge management processes. And then of course, um, it, you know, they are actually one. Your objective is to bring KCS and knowledge man uh, case management into one uh, process. And uh, we'll kind of get more, more into that as well. But um, you do have to think of it as one process, not two separate processes. Uh, last but not the least, follow the full uh, KCS uh, recipe closely. Uh, and, um, you know, if, uh, someone I knew used to give this analogy, if you want a perfect cookie, you don't keep changing the amount of flour and sugar and butter every time you bake it. You find the right recipe and you stick to the ratios. And that's when you can get the perfect cookie every time you bake it. And with, uh, with KCS, it's kind of like that. You have the recipe, you have the, the methodology uh, documented out for you. It's very tempting to take shortcuts. Um, we, and, it, and with experience, you realize you just mustn't. And if you don't, you will get to um, uh, the, right, uh, the right outcomes that you want for your business. Uh, the last st stack is technology. And we actually uh, focused on how would we make the engineer's life easier here. And these were simple things. These were simple things like, you know, look at all your case fields and see what the mapping is for articles and are they the same? And if they weren't, could they be the same? And can we make them the same? We also looked at could, uh, you know, cause your case basically becomes your work in progress for an article. So as the case is getting documented and if they've documented it well, can you just have a button that you can press to create an article and it takes all the relevant information from the case and posts it into the article. So those type of um, uh, things that we did uh, with the technology piece helped with adoption because the users were, were you know, they saw the positives coming out of it and um, uh, they were more inclined to, to um, follow the processes themselves. So, um, you know, think about just making knowledge uh, just less of a process burden and make it more natural, more ingrained in the organization. And that is what will help you sustain the, uh, the practice over a long period of time. So I'll pause at that. Next, I think I'm gonna hand over to KK who will take us through the training and the coaching program. KK, over to you. Thank you, Amit. That was really uh, insightful. Uh, so before we get into uh, my topics of training and coaching, I just like to give a, a quick intro about me. So I have been in the support industry for over seven years and currently I am a team lead for the uh, Archimize chat support team. Uh, I'm also a lead KCS coach. Um, like uh, I work with over 15 plus KCS users of various KCS entitlements. Uh, I have been part of this program at Akamai since its inception. So I, I have pretty much grown from a KCS candidate to a, a lead coach. And through these years, I have been an active contributor to this program, conducting several live trainings, mentoring individuals and elevating coaches. And so um, one of my key achievements was during 19 and 20, where uh, I, along with Monique, set up the KCS capabilities for our Akamai BOC pretty much from the scratch. Um, 
so that was where we actually had a lot of action and a lot of learning uh, lastly i am also a next generation technical leader certified it's a one year long leadership program at akamai uh, in my free time i also enjoy photography and books uh, next slide please so moving into the topic the first thing i'll be touching upon is our approach to training training is often not discussed in these webinars but it is the most critical part to be included in the change management strategy our training for engineers is largely focused on ocm and this is a live 4 hour session as you can see from our agenda image on the left we mostly focus on the kcs methodologies and the how to do it in the crm is at the last because that's the easy part we cover things like kcs origins a high level overview of both evolve and solve loops but then really deep dive into the solve loop and focus on the efficient ways to capture structure reuse and improve knowledge in these sessions we encourage a lot of practicing so the engineers practice searching creating editing and also do content standard check and attach accuracy even though these are the responsibilities of coach and not everyone in the sessions are a coach we consider it as important for everyone to understand the process so that they are comfortable with it later on before we even get into the sessions of practice we educate them on the why and the benefits of this for example if i don't search i may be creating a duplicate and polluting the kb database or if i don't attach the correct article i'm providing bad data for our kcs driven problem management and like amit said we emphasize very strong focus on case management and how diligent case notes make kcs easy you must place a strong emphasis on kcs and case management being one next slide please so during these sessions we also open up the dialogue so that we can dissolve a lot of these misconceptions the first one being some people think the idea of kcs is great but it won't work for their complex environment or their complex nature of work so in our training during the origins of kcs topic we talk about it being born and evolved over a period of 20 years and how it was born from the need to support ever changing complex technologies then we show the consortium for service innovation website the membership page and point out how a majority of the companies invested in kcs are actually very high tech and high complex companies we talk about how no one can stay an expert before the knowledge becomes outdated we also encourage continuous learning and continuous sharing of these knowledge so that we stay as smes and we stay as the hero of the organization not the roadblock this specific discussion serves as elevating concerns for both the misconception of you won't need me anymore as well as stifling knowledge holders and the other thing which we hear is it's it's more time and it's work for us right so we proactively educate users that they are already doing most of this we just showing them a proven and a more efficient way to do things that brings additional benefits and after they get over the learning curve studies show that it's it's sometimes even quicker we also show them the benefits of 90 by 0 rule which is the publishing of a knowledge article before a case is closed we also take them uh, through the re rediscovery curve which also plays a role in the next column that is uh, the common question about hiring a team to do some uh, or all of the work of uh, knowledge management we make sure people understand that knowledge workers are best suited for this because they are already holding the work in progress knowledge in their case and they just have uh, to use that because they have all the context and the tacit knowledge and not to mention an uh, ever growing backlog of outdated knowledge and loss of timely service uh, so putting all these together we consider our training uh, to be uh, an open dialogue where everybody gets to share their thoughts and we break a lot of uh, dissolve a lot of misconceptions uh, next slide please another item people want to know about is how our coaching program is structured 
Firstly, we recognize our coaches are the backbone of our program. They are the change agents. We make it very clear. The coaches own the coaching program. The program manager supports them and helps steer them to best practices and, and avoid pitfalls. If coaches own the program, they develop a sense of pride in it. They will continue to care and do their best, which results in a strong coaching foundation and change agent community. For logistics, we have either monthly or twice a month coaching calls depending on the geo. A lead coach in each geo hosts the call. Monique attends them to ensure alignment. In addition to updates during these calls, we also go through real life scenarios. Each coach brings into the table what they have been experiencing with their coaches and with their, with their coaches. And we kind of take turns and discussing and uh, solving each other's uh, queries. We also um, walk through our daily dashboards and uh, user processes. Uh, this platform has been a real boon in terms of collaborating for all the coaches. And also it has been a really good opportunity for everybody to come forward and share their uh, thoughts. Our initial ratio when rolling out this program was somewhere in the lines of one coach is to three coaches, but then it organically grew to now currently being somewhere between one coach managing over five or six coaches. So if anyone wants to know more on our coaching program or processes or dashboards, uh, you can uh, find that in our consortium website, we'll be sharing uh, uh, the keyword, but then you can search for it as KCS in action, coaching dashboard at Akamai. Next slide, please. On, on the topic of coaching, like you'll really want to reinforce a lot of these items during design because in the minds of people, when you enforce uh, or when you actually walk them through this new change management pol policies, it stays in their mind when uh, it's in the early on process. But then for maintenance, much of this needs ongoing communication to the entire organization, purely so that it stays on top of their mind. And one critical item that is important for everyone to understand is the content standard checklist and the linking accuracy are purely coaching tools. They are the indicators and not scores for individuals. Everyone grows and learns at their own pace and these coaching tools gives us the trending and points us if you're, if you're proceeding in the right direction. And from a process perspective, it is also critical that our coaches don't do everything. We share this uh, quote with our coaches and managers all the time. Our EMEA director said it early on and it's proven to be very valuable. The coach is for quality and practice. The manager is for adoption and accountability. So another critical item with uh, Amit touched on was we hear uh, if, if, if at all, like people are struggling with KCS, uh, we find that it's, uh, it's not really the KCS they're struggling with, but they're they're struggling with case management. So we, again, uh, always emphasize the need for diligent case notes, which makes KCS easier. And as for the technology aspect, in the past, we struggled with coaching and coaching tools. So we built our own coaching dashboards to make it easier for our coaches. And we also give access to the managers so they have a real-time view of their teams and the coaching uh, program. So uh, these dashboards, uh, we have a separate webinar on, on our dashboard. So if anyone's interested, please go check it out in, our, uh, uh, in the consortium members page. You'll be able to search for it with the keyword cases in action. Next slide. I think now I'll uh, turn it over to Monique who will cover the next four topics. Over to you, Monique. Thanks, KK. So, in order to enable the entire organization, you know, after we've educated them on a lot of these things, um, we need to make sure that that communication is ongoing, but also that we have our leaders and our managers, you know, everyone in the organization on the same page. So early on, we spend a lot of time up front with our leaders. In fact, every manager, director, and even our VP attended a workshop that I facilitated called managing in a KCS support model. It was 
a lot of discussion and examples around managing by behaviors and understanding what all the indicators mean. And one of the key items from that session was avoiding the words metrics or even reports. And instead, whenever we're talking about numbers in regards to KCS, we use the term indicators uh, because things are not black and white. They do require interpretation. And we also wanted to make it easy for them to stay involved. And so besides the tools, we provided simple guidance. And they really appreciated that because it meant that they each didn't have to come up with their own view viewpoint or things to do. Instead, there's a quick reference um, and it aligned them all. And so that quick reference includes four things that they can do to enable and maintain success. And they are one, supporting KCS coaching, making sure people have time to, to attend and hold those sessions. Two, weekly inspections of their teams, just to look at all the, the indicators and the health. Uh, three is quarterly coaching alignment. So um, oftentimes there's movements and we wanna make sure everybody has the right uh, coach to coach balance. Um, and nobody falls through the cracks. And then the fourth thing is really celebrating. And that's one of the most important things. And we'll get into that a little bit more later. Another item people often ask us about is how our program is structured. How many coaches and KDEs we have. So we have 22 lead KCS coaches, 107 coaches, about 450 TSEs, and then we also have nine KDE coaches who coach KDEs on knowledge domain activities and the content standard checklist. And we have 33 KDEs uh, in addition to those, those nine. And the reason, part of the reason that they also have coaches besides you know, going through the KDE, KDA stuff is that our KDEs are not part of the solve loop. Um, so it's beneficial for them to still kind of have that regular checking with coaches. Our KCS council has 14 members and it's a combination of coaches, KDEs, managers, and leads. And then the program itself is broken into three sub programs. And so that's coaching, training, and KDE. And then technology is broken into case management and other support tools that Jackson manages as part of continuous support improvement. And then we also recently got a new KCS team member, Arkadeb, who is leading the support for the KDEs. Um, as KK mentioned, uh, coaches own the coaching program. And so likewise, we give that message to KDEs. They own the KDE program. We're there to support them. Um, and even when it comes to the knowledge workers, KCS in general belongs to them. And that is a message that they constantly hear from us. And then even when I was initially setting up coaching in KDE, um, part of having uh, the structure set that way and having them own it for me was a way to scale, but also to give them autonomy and purpose. And what I realized recently um, is that it is very much like the change principles of mindsets and behaviors from Cotter. And so there were three that actually stood out to me. And the first one was select few and diverse many. And that is having more people able to make change happen versus just carrying out someone else's directive. The other one is head and heart, which speaks to most people are not inspired by logic alone, but the fundamental desire to contribute to a larger cause with meaning and purpose. And then lastly, have to and want to, which speaks to those who feel included in a meaningful opportunity will help create change. And here's the key part, in addition to their normal responsibilities. And that's what coaches and KDEs do, right? They're, they're not full-time roles. So those ideas plus Cotter's concept of the hierarchy network, um, if you're not familiar with that, we can put a, a link to that in the chat as well. Those models are what I see when I analyze our program. And I really believe that's what makes helps make it successful. And then um, also, I think adding the value that we place on roles like coaches and KDEs, um, 
one, it's appreciated by them because it makes the role desirable. For example, uh, we have an opening in the continuous support um, improvement team and my manager Paula was telling me about resumes that she was receiving and many people were listing things like KDE and coaching accomplishments. And what she saw from that is people are proud to reach those roles and to be there, which is great because we're very grateful to have them. Now onto our licensing model. So since licensing is a part of quality insurance, it's important that as users move through those permission sets, they're consistently demonstrating the appropriate behaviors and that those behaviors are really baked into their DNA. And to make sure that we allow people to do that, we do not set a goal on when a person should move from one level to the next. Uh, for example, um, in the past, out of good intentions, we did have a goal where candidates should become contributors within six months and then within another six months onto the next role. But what we found was that people can display these roles and qualities quickly. And they can do it well enough to meet that objective, and especially if it's an objective. But because it's not yet become habit or baked into their DNA, some of them started to revert. And so the quality started to slip. So that was removed as an goal. There are no timelines now. Um, the way that our model works is after the initial live training, you take an online exam via our learning and development program. And when you pass, you become a candidate. And then after working with your coach from, for some time and the coach feels you're ready based on some suggested performance indicators. And again, that's another keyword suggested because every team is going to be different based off of their product and product life cycle. The opportunities they have to fix or create content, it's going to vary based off of what they support. So once they reach an, a, a time when the coach feels they're ready, the coach will actually submit a nomination form and then two lead coaches review the performance indicators as well as the submission notes from the nominating coach as to why they feel they're ready for the next permission set. And it's usually some great stuff in there, a lot of kudos. Um, and then they either agree on an approval or they make detailed notes send it back to the coach and the person um, as to what they should really focus on and they'll send supporting materials to help them achieve it next time. And so for publisher, it's the same process, but there's an exam tacked onto it with three things that the person has to do. And the first one is create a draft facing customer article. And what we're really looking for here is um, them to show their ability to document a complex issue and still stay within the criteria. And the second thing is provide us with an internal article that you think can be made external and then provide all the detailed, wonderful notes that you think uh, would allow that to happen. So how would you change it to enable it to become external? And then the third thing is, okay, find an external article that needs fixing. And again, give us the details on the changes you would make. So same process, the head coach reviews, um, two head coaches uh, for approval. And it is a lot of work on our part, but it's a solid gate and people really have to earn it. And so that feeds into our, our next item, which is recognition. Um, when users move through that, the licensing levels and reach either contributor or publisher, we make a big deal out of it because we're reinforcing the behaviors we want. And so the positive comments from the nomination form that the coach submitted and then the head, co head coach feedback when they approved it, they're included in a post on our internal community with fun pictures um, of the recipient and their manager, or maybe it's their team celebrating the recognition. And then the cool thing is the rest of the organization, no matter where they are in the, in, in, around the globe, they, they get to come in and comment and congratulate them on, on you know, reaching that milestone. And it really is a fun thing to see, especially when they get creative with their pictures, uh, which has been a little challenging lately due to everyone being remote, but they're still finding ways to do it. Another recognition form is on our quarterly all hands call. So RVP always recognizes both 
the author and anybody who made an update, who did an edit to the article for both your, the, the top reused or top cited article, as well as the top externally viewed article for you know, the, the quarter, the period that we're in. We also recognize outcomes from KDE activities such as problem management or even cleanup efforts. And it's a great way for the organization to you know, see the results of the work and stay updated on the program as well. So give the knowledge workers credit for their success and accomplishments and make sure they know, again, this is their program. Uh, feedback is always welcome. And repeat that message during training and ongoing because they make it successful. The better they are at the solve loop, the more successful the program will be. And then again, lastly, encourage anyone to call out wins. So even if they're not in this regular realm of things that we, we recognize, um, it's still a good idea to call those out because recognition is fuel. And throughout the entire adoption, the things that you experience are going to change as you go through the journey. And you always want to make sure you're giving uh, scheduled updates. So if you're just starting and you're rolling out training waves, your updates should be about progress on that, feedback you're hearing, early wins, changes you need to make based off of the learnings. And so as you get into further stages, your updates are going to be on things like self-service success and KDE activities. But the important thing is that you're transparent because transparency um, really allows you to either blow the trumpet on those wins or steer your program back on course with adjustment. And these updates, uh, they should be to everyone, to all your stakeholders. So you can use things like QBRs, all hands, team meetings, and so forth. Um, the key here is that you cannot over communicate. And that is a core principle of OCM. It can be the same message, but via different channels. So you can have that same message come in blogs, newsletters, videos, all hands, and so forth. But the more people hear it, the easier it is for them to retain. And then if you can layer some lighthearted fun in there, it's even better. Um, along with that, recognition should start early so people recognize desired behaviors like we talked about um, on the recognition slide. But it's also crucial that any stage from conception to continuous improvement, that your uh, leadership team and your executives show support, right? That they have periodic attention and inspection because it shows the teams that it's not just lip service. To give you an example, um, our VP, Scott Lerner, he weekly reviews our coaching sessions. And one week we had a record number of sessions. And so then he sends out this email to the entire organization. And he says, I'm amazed at this accomplishment. We beat the past record by this amount. And then he included a chart and then a meme, a picture that was celebrating the success. And I can't tell you how many engineers and coaches, you know, reached out to me after that and to say, you know, how much they appreciated, appreciated that and how cool it was. Um, and it, it it's made such a big impact. That was probably about six months ago that this happened. And someone else brought it up again last month. So you can see that it really did make an impression on everyone. And it sent the message that KCS is important. Now, it's not only important, but it is the great enabler. And that's what the KCS Adoption Guide calls it. The Adoption Guide includes a ton more things than I have on this slide, but this is our high level visual. Um, KCS is connected to so many areas of the business. It's not a silo. It enables self-service, the community, um, moderation, case management, intelligence swarming, problem management. The key here is always look to connect it to other things. Think about where knowledge gets leveraged. It is not just the case. And the more you leverage it in the ecosystem, the better it gets and the better everything gets. And so back to our flow um, to summarize our presentation, but I do wanna leave you with my number one tip before we go into Q&A and that is 
keep moving and improving your program. You are never done. Thank you. And if people want to come off the mute um, to ask questions or uh, Christina and Jackson, if you have any that were not able or you were not able to answer in the chat, we can start with those. Yeah, Monique, I've got three that were in chat that would be great if the panel could answer. The first one's from Rupa. Is there a strategy that worked to convince the senior leadership to split the support engineer's time towards KCS? coaching sessions, drafting knowledge articles, especially when a lot of the work is reactive and the challenges they can't provide dedicated time consistently. That's yeah, probably for a minute, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's actually uh, a common question that comes up from leadership when you start to talk about and sort of paint the picture of what needs to be done. And, um, uh, you know, this is where uh, what I found helpful was to go back and educate them on uh, all the other advantages of um, the methodology, right? Uh, the quality angle, uh, the reuse of article. Uh, th that reuse is, is actually extremely important because what happens is every time you are taking up your link rate, what's happening is you're using knowledge you are operating in a more consistent standardized manner and your engineer hopefully doesn't have to solve that problem from scratch again, right? So there is a lot of savings there. So you have to begin to sort of contrast the value that the methodology brings and the efficiencies it brings to your internal organization. And then also how external articles might help to um, take some uh, or you know, put some customers on the self-service track. Both of those are, are actually very big uh, wins for the program. And, and then the, you know, the third thing I go back to is if you've got a fundamentally strong case management program, knowledge management is not a program which is you know, double its weight sitting on top of it. If you do case management well and you combine it with um, uh, knowledge management, it actually should not be that big of a burden on the uh, engineering team, on the engineers or, or uh, the support team and the services teams. So I think it, easier said than done, you have to sort of, um, you know, uh, sort of show them the light first and then you have to kind of um, uh, show some examples and you can actually build a business case that says, even if it takes a little bit more effort now, all, all the, the cost of not doing this is just not worth it. Like you have to do this so that you get all the other advantages. And there was a quick follow-up in chat for that same question. Did you have to hire more support engineers to achieve this? Uh, no, we did not. Uh, we did not. Uh, we were uh, going through sort of a natural um, uh, growth spurt uh, during those those years as well, a couple of years, um, 16 and 17. So that was not that much of a concern for us, although the question was raised, uh, but we did not go down that path. Um, on the next question that we had uh, for the Q&A that we uh, were not able to answer in the chat quite yet is probably directed towards uh, Monique, but the, uh, this is from Prashant. When we say knowledge uh, candidate exam, is it just a knowledge check during the course of training or something after they are finished with the training? How long before new hires take this candidate exam and is there any set threshold to pass? Yes, so um, as soon as somebody's onboarded as a new hire, they go through a, a bunch of different things to onboard them. Part of that is um, getting them scheduled for one of the live training sessions. Um, at the end of the session, um, so we go through some key points before, you know, we let them go to the um, Akamai University, which is where they take the online exam. And um, we give them time after that. And so it's usually about 30 minutes. Most people usually pass the first shot. Um, if they don't pass right away, then they come back and they work with the instructor. So the instructor actually waits around to make sure everybody passes. And then they go through discussions on which items they didn't pass, and then they can go back and take it again. So since it's just, you know, candidate, candidate you're publishing internally, um, I think, you know, the 
the risk of you know giving them a candidate license is, is not that not that great. Great. Okay, we have another question from Rupa. Do you have any examples of how KCS has collaborated with training programs? So, uh, Rupa, if you want to come off mute and clarify, do you mean? Um, so the the use case I was thinking of. Thank you. Um, sure. The use case I was thinking of is um, some of the articles could be used towards training the support engineers. So as you have new product lines and things getting released, um, if we tag your KBAs, your knowledge base articles appropriately, probably reusing them for training and ramping new engineers, and vice versa. If you have a long course that's developed by the training team, can we kind of like create um, bite-sized knowledge base articles so that that can be um, used on support cases or even for deflection for off support cases, things of that nature. So have you guys tried any sort of like cross team collaboration with training teams as the question? So with, with the internal training teams, um, I'm not sure on that. I have to check if they leverage um, KB documentation, but um, even within that, you know, the, the sources of where you can go to look for the materials that they're being trained on, um, KB is included in that. Um, but one thing I think that kind of comes close to this is we have something called product um, serviceability or readiness. And so our KDEs have the opportunity as part of their objectives to pick that as an item. So when a product is in beta, uh, they can start collecting use cases. And when they're preparing for training, to do the training, they can start documenting uh, KBs so that they're ready for um, the masses to use once that product goes into production. Right, and that's the kind of approach that we're taking. I just wanted to see if you know there's any um, best practices that we can reuse from you, from your experience. Thank you. All right, the next question we have is from Mora. Uh, I'm wondering about your training of leadership. It sounds like you used a consultant. Is there a standard training available for leaders to better understand what KCS is, or is it recommended to find a consultant for this? I can probably take a, take a stab at this, and, and, and maybe there are folks from the consortium who have, um, who have an idea of uh, uh, what uh, training might exist in this form, but, um, uh, when I uh, was looking at this, uh, there really wasn't um, any uh, training as such that we could we could rely on. Uh, this though needs to be a conversation uh, because I feel like everyone from their experiences, uh, past experiences has a position on whether this works or it doesn't. And if you have someone who understands the the um, understands the methodology, has experience in rolling it out. And we, we didn't have Monique on our team at that point. Um, uh, we were just starting out. So if we had Monique, we would have just had this conversation internally. But there was one other advantage of bringing in someone from the outside because there was a zero vested interest. It was just an engagement. It was just for their expertise. And um, none of the questions, none of the answers were slanted in any way. And you know, whenever you have a team, there are always certain angles that you know um, a certain a certain team members might be looking at. So it just keeps it very to the point and uh, a lot more about the methodology if you're able to bring in someone from outside. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. That's, that's uh, really the takeaway there. And uh, this is Arnfin. I did add a link in the uh, chat to all the online and live training. And so we do have leadership training, um, the practices training, coach training. We also have a, quite a bit of uh, online training, uh, getting to the why on the digital transformation fundamentals, how to manage that in that digital economy, yeah. as well as the uh, KCS V6 fundamentals and their certifications to support that. So the link's in the chat there. Great, thanks Arnfin and Amit. The next question is from John. You mentioned the importance of integrating KCS with case management systems. Can you elaborate on what that means? Uh, so, want to take I that? can take that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, oftentimes, and this is more like 
20 years ago, it, you, you would have your CRM and then you'd have your knowledge base and, you know, you used to have to have your developers build APIs and stuff to pass information between the two, or they were so just disjointed that it was a lot of work, right? Um, but nowadays you usually have them in one system or they're, they're easier to integrate. And so when we say integrating your case management into your, your knowledge base, the thing is um, they have to be able to search from the case experience. Um, so all those KCS practices of searching, creating, reusing, linking, um, modifying, all of those have to be able, you need to be able to do it within the same system. Right. I mean, they can be separate, but as long as they operate as one, that's really what what matters. And especially when you're going to create content. So, again, you know, getting rid of that antiquated idea that I need to update my case, then I need to go update the a work in progress article. You don't need to do that if you have a nice system where your case is the work in progress. And so as long as you're taking case, diligent case notes, when the time comes and you have your mitigation, it's one click to pass everything over from fields that usually have the same description. So my case might say, um, these are, you know, this is the resolution and my article might say, this is the resolution. So it's an easy to one correlation for the knowledge workers that are working in the case. And now it becomes just a matter of after they pass everything over with one click, they're formatting it, you know, according to KCS, um, you know, the style guide and content standard. Great, that's everything I see in chat. If anybody, we have two minutes left. Kelly, I don't know if you wanna invite anyone to come off mute and ask one last question. I, so, I uh, think, yeah, go for it. Who is that? Uh, I just like to add to the question which uh, Vipin had uh, asked. I think Jackson had already answered in the chat, but uh, just to add, uh, right? So we have an internal uh, document which kind of gives an analogy of what exactly is attach accuracy. We use uh, the fixing your car tire analogy. So, like, there is multiple ways. Uh, let's say you have to write a document for fixing your tire. You, you'd say, what is the best practices to fix a tire? Or, uh, like, go ahead, change the tire uh, or take it to your uh, you know, nearest uh, like car mechanic shop. So all of these are relevant to this uh, particular issue. So we give a certain analogy to the engineers and the engineers, the, the coaches, uh, they are the ones who's gonna actually look at those articles and the uh, case uh, problem statement and connect if they both are relevant and then consider uh, if it's an accurate attach or not. So that's how we uh, measure if it's an accurate attach. There is no black and white. There's definitely black, gray and white. And then uh, what tool do we use? Is there an internal external? So we definitely have our coaching dashboard, uh, which we have uh, mentioned in our uh, presentation. So that gives us the uh, numbers, uh, you know, like it's definitely not, there's no uh, metric around accuracy as well. We definitely aim for uh, something uh, about uh, 80 or 90, but then we don't look at numbers. That's purely for, as an indicator, uh, those dashboards are used. So uh, I, I hope that gives uh, additional clarity to the question. And it is a home right. tool, yeah. Yeah, and thank you so much, Zarf, and thank you so much to the Akamai team for sharing your expertise and all the prep preparation you did for that excellent presentation. So thank you all for attending, and thanks again to the Akamai team, and everyone have a great rest of the day, and hope to see you on a future KCS event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.